Let me pray for us, and uh, we'll get rolling. Father, thank you for this time you've given us tonight. Uh, thank you for the opportunity just to pause and consider uh, this new year, new semester, uh, new opportunities to grow in Christlikeness, to grow in fellowship with one another. And uh, Lord, I just ask that um, you would use this semester for your glory, uh, for the building of our church, uh, for our individual sanctification, uh, for the strengthening of our relationships, and, uh, and ultimately to your glory. Lord, I pray that you would uh, that you would you would receive glory from what we do. That, uh, that Lord, there would be um, as a result of our, our growth in godliness, our growth in um, in, in following uh, Christ. Uh, Lord, that that people would would see and and give you glory for what uh, you are doing uh, in us and through us. Um, Lord, I pray that uh, as we consider uh, your word uh, even tonight, uh, Lord, that you would. Use this time uh, to make us more like Christ. I pray you would fill us with your spirit and open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, tonight we get to uh, to have a, a kickoff tonight before we get started with our regular discipleship classes, which will start next Wednesday and then the following Sunday. And... Um, we, uh, in, in the fall, we had a kickoff, and, and now here in the spring, we get a kickoff. And um, as, uh, as I considered what to talk about tonight, uh, you know, there are, there are certain, uh, on the one hand, as you look at Scripture, uh, you have, for instance, the Apostle John writing about Jesus that, uh, that, that there's so much more that happened in Jesus' earthly ministry that the volumes, you know, you know the, all the volumes in the world couldn't even contain it. And uh, we have a God who is infinite. We have a God who can't be measured. And so there's always something more. There's always something new that we could be uh, learning, studying, thinking about. Uh, but then also in Scripture, you have this repeated uh, theme of, of remember, 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 of, of, of repeating things that have already been said over and over and over and over again. Uh, because there are, while, while there is no end to what we can explore about God, there's also a need to constantly be reminded of what we already know. Uh, and so uh, tonight uh, we're going to be talking about things that um, if, you were, if you were here in the fall, if you've been around for a while, we've, we've been talking about these. These are repeated ideas. These are not new things. Um, but there are certain things that are just worth repeating and worth uh, remembering again, worth uh, revisiting so that we don't just hear them and acknowledge them. Uh, but that they sink deep into our hearts and form us. Uh, and so uh, we're going to talk tonight about uh, our discipleship classes, but not just the discipleship classes by themselves, but how our discipleship classes fit into the larger context of our mission as a church. We want everything we do as a church to be filtered through our mission. Uh, and uh, because if we are uh, just wandering around doing whatever we feel like doing, we're going to be wandering aimless. We're going to be uh, – we'll, we'll drift off from what God has called us to do. Uh, but the fact is Jesus has given us in the Great Commission a mission, marching orders that we are to follow. And so if we are to do anything as a church, uh, it needs to be filtered through that mission statement. Uh, and, and filtered in, in such a way that we say no to the things that don't accomplish our mission, and we say yes to those things that do accomplish our mission. Um, and so we're going to uh, consider tonight how our mission as a church, the mission that Jesus has given us, uh, fits into what, um, or excuse me, how, how discipleship classes are an expression and, and one way that we carry out our mission together as a church. Um, so, first of all, let's consider our mission to be and make disciples. Our mission to be and make disciples. Who can tell me what our mission statement is as a church? We exist to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ in Stephenville, in Rome County, and beyond. Yes? That's all I know. By our own power? No. By the power of the Holy Spirit to our own glory. The glory, of God the, Father. the glory of God the Father. There you go. We exist to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ in Erath County and around the world by the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. There are uh, every every word of that statement is important, 
but I want to highlight just uh, the, 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 the first couple of terms there um, as we look tonight. Uh, first of all, we exist to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, so the reason why we don't just say we exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ is because if we are to make disciples of Jesus, first we have to be disciples of Jesus. One of the uh, one of the things that we can be tempted to think if we only think in terms of making disciples is that there's maybe somehow we graduate that I, I'm a disciple. Uh, but then I'm gonna once I've been discipled, I graduate from disciple, and now I become disciple maker. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, we never graduate from disciple to disciple maker. We are always disciples, even as we make disciples. We are always first and foremost disciples of Jesus ourselves before we are disciple makers. And so that's why we want to make sure we clarify: we don't just exist to make disciples; we exist to be and make. Disciples. Uh, but that being said, what is a disciple? Well, the word means a follower or a learner, and a disciple of Jesus is a person who follows Jesus as Lord. A disciple is a person who follows Jesus as Lord. So the Bible uses the word disciple as a synonym for believer, as a synonym for Christian. So disciple is not a special class of Christians. To be a Christian is to be a disciple. Every person who has been born again, who's repented of their sin, who's trusted in Jesus as their Savior, is a disciple, is a follower of Jesus. Uh, or we could put it this way, if someone's not following Jesus, that person's not a Christian. That's what it means to be a disciple. Uh, that's what it means to be a Christian. In Luke 14, 27, Jesus said, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. To be a disciple of Jesus, to, to be a Christian, is to come after him, to follow him. A disciple is a person who follows Jesus as Lord. So that's what a disciple is, but what is uh, discipleship? Discipleship. Well, discipleship is a term that just describes the life of following Jesus. The life of following Jesus. So a disciple is a person who follows Jesus as Lord. Discipleship is a term that describes the life of following Jesus. Um, so uh, you'll hear some people use the word discipleship as a synonym for disciple making, um, and that's fine. Um, I prefer to use the word discipleship just in a, in a broader way to refer to the whole life of following Jesus, not only uh, making disciples. Certainly making disciples is part of our life of following Jesus, it's part of our discipleship. But everything entailed in following Jesus is part of discipleship. Meditation on scripture is part of discipleship, part of the life of following Jesus. Um, uh, uh, seeking to repent of sin daily is part of discipleship. It's part of the life of following <coughs> Jesus. Uh, when we evangelize, that's part of uh, discipleship certainly as well. Uh, but everything that we do in our life as followers of Jesus is part of our discipleship. So, those are a couple of terms. Disciple, a person who follows Jesus as Lord. Discipleship, the life of following Jesus. And uh, we exist, first and foremost, to be disciples of Jesus Christ. To follow him um, and to, have, to live a life of discipleship, of following Jesus. Second, we exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ. To make disciples of Jesus Christ. So, this is the mission that Jesus has given us as a local church. Turn with me to Matthew 28. And verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Someone read that for us. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. When Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right, thank you. So when we get to verses 19 and 20, uh, grammatically there is one main verb, and that is make disciples. That's the core 
uh, of, of the hub of that verse. All the other verbs in that, those two verses uh, orbit around that central command to make disciples. So as we think about making disciples, let's define that term as well. So a minute ago, we said discipleship is what? The life of following Jesus. Right, the life of following Jesus. So disciple making then is helping someone else follow Jesus. Or we can put it this way, disciple making is one disciple helping another disciple or other disciples with their discipleship. Disciple making is helping someone else follow Jesus. It's one disciple helping another disciple with their discipleship. There are three elements that Jesus gives us to disciple making in the Great Commission. First, we go out. We go out. Jesus says, go. And in this first step of disciple making, the goal is to invite people who are currently not following Jesus to come and become followers of Jesus, to become disciples of Jesus. Um, we see in this command to go that making disciples doesn't happen by accident. Making disciples doesn't happen by setting up shop and saying, y'all come. Making disciples happens by going. It's not a passive sit around and let people come to us. It's an active go out to other people. <clears throat> uh, and we don't just go to them for any reason. Uh, we don't just go to make their life on earth more comfortable. We go to them with a message. We go to the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we invite them to trust in Jesus as Savior and follow him as Lord, to become a disciple of Jesus. So first we go out, we actively pursue those who are not following Jesus and invite them to uh, follow Jesus. That's one element of disciple making. Second, we bring in, we go out, we bring in. So I get that from where Jesus says we're to baptize new disciples. Baptism is an entrance. When we baptize someone, we're bringing them in. Uh, and that entrance has two sides to it. On the one hand, you have the new disciple who is being baptized, who is entering into this family of disciple makers, uh, into this community of those who have been saved um, and who uh, identify with Christ. And then on the other hand, this entrance, uh, you have the church who is doing the baptizing, who is welcoming this new disciple, this person who they went out to, who once was not a follower of Jesus, who has become a follower of Jesus by the grace of God. We bring them in, we baptize them, and, and, and in, help them enter into uh, this body of Christ that the Lord Jesus is head of. For the person being baptized, it's their first step of following Jesus. And uh, being baptized, uh, when, a, when a person is being baptized, they're publicly saying, I want to identify with Christ, and I want to identify with the body of Christ. I want to identify with the one who saved me, who died for me, and rose again. And so the person goes down in the water, comes out, and identifies with Christ uh, as one who has died with Christ and has been raised with Christ. Uh, but the person being baptized is also saying, I want to be identified with all those who have come before me who have also uh, been baptized and have entered into this body of Christ. And then for the church doing the baptism, whenever we baptize someone, we're affirming uh, this person has repented and believed in the gospel. This person has become a follower of Jesus. He is or she is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we want to welcome him or her into our family of believers. So we go out to those who are not followers of Jesus. We invite them to become followers of Jesus. When they repent of sins and trust in Christ by his grace, we bring them in, we baptize them, we welcome them into the family. And then third, we grow up. So we go out, we bring in, and then we grow up. Go out, bring in, grow up. You have to do the hand motions if you're really going to understand this truth. You go out, you bring in, you grow up. 
And it looks, it looks an awful lot like, you know, the steeple and the people, but it's not. It's, you know, it's 2.0. It's, it's next level hand motion. It's okay. This is, this is adult discipleship class. Okay. We're in the wrong class. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should have had some snack time plan, honestly. Right so go out, bring in, grow up. All right. So Jesus, I get this from, um, so again, the central command is to make disciples. First, we go. He says, go, go out. Second, baptize, bring in. Third, he says to teach disciples to observe all that he has commanded us. So making disciples is not over when a person repents and believes the gospel. Making a disciple is not over just when a person crosses the threshold to become a disciple. Uh, the goal of the Great Commission is not just to make converts uh, or to get a bunch of decisions or to increase membership roles. Discipleship entails the whole life of following Jesus, right? We defined it that way. Discipleship is the life of following Jesus, not just a moment of decision. And likewise, we are not making disciples unless we are taking ownership of a disciple's full journey, unless we are teaching those who have entered into this community of faith, teaching those who have been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to also observe all that Jesus commanded. And that takes time. That's not just a one-time thing or a one-month thing. That's a life of following Jesus and learning to observe all that Jesus commanded. So teaching disciples, growing up together, Learning to observe all that Jesus commanded. That happens in multiple different ways within the life of a local church. Uh, within our church, it happens in multiple venues. Teaching, uh, this, uh, teaching to observe, as the, uh, Jesus says in Matthew, that happens in gathered worship. It happens uh, certainly in the preaching of God's word. Uh, but there's other ways, too. Uh, the songs that we sing form us. They teach us about God's uh, word, um, even the order in which we do things when we worship forms us as disciples. Uh, but teaching disciples also happens outside of just our weekly gathered worship. Uh, teaching disciples ha happens in personal disciple making. We may meet one on one with a person to help that person follow Jesus, which is disciple making. Um, and to teach, you may be teaching that person, encouraging that person to observe. What Jesus has commanded, that's, that's one way of disciple making. Uh, anytime you're actively seeking to encourage a disciple of Jesus to take a step of observing what Jesus commanded, you're making disciples. Um, so this is not, you know, we don't have to like, uh, you, you can always grow as a disciple maker, uh, but there's not some like secret sauce to what it means to make a disciple. If you, if there is someone who is a follower of Jesus and you are helping them to observe something that Jesus commanded. If you're saying, hey, Jesus commanded this, you do that. That's disciple making, okay? Teaching them to observe all that Christ commanded. Uh, biblical counseling is one form of personal disciple making. Um, it's, a, it's helping, it's one disciple helping another disciple observe what Jesus has commanded. Um, and so certainly there's, there's corporate worship, there's one-on-one, -on -one, uh, Discipleship, but then also teaching, growing up together, teaching to observe all that Jesus commanded happens in a venue like this, in our classes. And that brings us to what we're here tonight for, what we're going into this semester for Wednesdays and Sundays. Our classes are called discipleship classes. I mean, we could call them disciple making classes, maybe. Uh, we're calling them discipleship classes because we're aiming in these classes on Wednesdays and Sundays to help one another observe what Jesus commanded, to teach one another to observe what Jesus commanded. So, um, so let's talk about discipleship classes, our vision for discipleship classes, why we do what we do on Wednesdays and Sundays. So again, discipleship classes are intended to help us follow Jesus. That's, that's the goal. There are opportunities for being disciples, and there are opportunities for making disciples. There are opportunities for learning to make progress in observing what Jesus has commanded, and there are opportunities to teach others to observe what Jesus commanded. Um, and so uh, if we're going to uh, 
uh, fulfill Jesus' great commission when he says, teach them to observe all that I've commanded, we need uh, two different aspects of that. First, we have to teach what Jesus commanded. Right? You can't observe something. You can't observe a commandment unless you know the commandment. So first, teach what Jesus commanded. Um, but then second, we have to teach how to observe what Jesus commanded. So you teach what it is and then how to do it. And that leads to our twofold vision for discipleship classes. Uh, because we want to know what Jesus commanded before we can observe it, first, discipleship classes teach how to read the Bible. Discipleship classes teach how to read the Bible because we have to know what Jesus commanded before we can observe it. Turn with me to Acts 17. <coughs> Acts 17, verse 2. Seventeen, verse ten. Somebody read verses ten through twelve for us. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews who were more noble, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness uh, and. Examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So uh, Paul and Silas had just left Thessalonica, um, where they were uh, rejected by um, the Jews there in Thessalonica, but they did make some disciples there. They uh, gathered together and, and uh, formed a local church. And, uh, if you're, and after he left, uh, not long after, I think from, boy, I can't remember. It's probably in this book right now. He was in – okay, I can't find it. He was in a city that was not Thessalonica, and he wrote some letters to that church back in Thessalonica – uh, and we don't know how many he wrote, but we know he wrote at least two, and we have them. They're called 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And if you want to learn more about what he wrote, you should be a part of our Bible study on 1 and 2 Thessalonians. But that's not what this passage is about. He left Thessalonica, and he found uh, the Bereans. That's what Acts 17, 10 through 12 is about. And uh, the Jews in Berea were more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica. Uh, that word noble has this idea of being open-minded. Uh, so what, what, is it, what do you think it means? Well, first of all, is being open-minded always a good thing? No, why not? Depends. It depends, okay, good. Diplomatic answer. <laughs> why, why, why might being open-minded be a bad thing? You're being open-minded to someone that is reasoning against Scripture entirely, like it's worthless, then that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, doesn't have the right perspective on what we should have over us and um, as an as the authority in our lives. Yeah. Any other downsides to being open-minded? So it's, it's definitely, open-mindedness uh, is not necessarily a good thing, yet Luke, as he's writing about the Bereans, tells Theophilus and us, the Bereans were more open-minded. He says that it's a good thing. So what, what does it mean to be open-minded in a good sense? Why was it good that the Bereans were open-minded? They were open to hearing about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, is, what does that mean? Paul was proclaiming to them from this. Right. They were open-minded about what he said from this. That's right, yeah. They were willing to receive the truth. Yeah. 
Yeah. Being open-minded to truth is different than being open-minded to lies. Right. It's only good to be open-minded if what you currently believe is wrong. Right. <laughs> um, nice. In relation to disciple-making, um, where it talks about helping someone else follow Jesus, you would have to be open to ways that you're not following Jesus, and that, that can be hard. That's right. That's yeah, absolutely. Because it, it, I mean, what I mean, I know Kurt, you're speaking a little tongue in cheek, but you're 100 percent true. That's what we're talking. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. To be yeah, you to be open minded is to admit I'm probably not thinking about something correctly, and it's humbling. It's hard to do that, but it's necessary if you're going to observe what Jesus commanded. If you're going to grow as a disciple, you have to be open to the idea that maybe there is something I don't know, or maybe there is something that I am wrong about. And I don't know what it is. And an unhealthy open-mindedness would say, um, man, I bet there's all sorts of things. And anything that sounds good, I'm going to be open to. But what the Bereans had, their open-mindedness, the reason why it was so good is because they were open-minded under the authority of Scripture. So look at those verses again, verses 10 through 12. Um, in fact, look specifically at verse 11 where that word comes up. Now, these Jews were more noble or more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. Well, what does he mean by that? They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So they were open to having their minds changed by scripture. They were open to the idea that maybe we hadn't been reading scripture fully you know, they were, as Robert said, they were open to the idea of Jesus being the Messiah. Uh, they weren't closed off thinking, we know about the Messiah and Jesus is him. They were open to considering that perhaps we've not been reading scripture correctly and we need to have scripture change our minds. We need to be open uh, to, to, um, to changing what we understand scripture to be. They were so committed to the truthfulness of scripture. They were so committed to the authority of scripture that they were open to letting scripture change their minds about the conclusions that they had previously come to. They received the word with all eagerness. Now this is, this is so key because they were not looking for Paul and Silas to affirm their preconceived ideas. Now we have to be, we have to be careful as we think about coming in, what kind, of, what kind of attitude we need to have when we come into a discipleship class. Uh, the better your theology, the more uh, dangerous it becomes, and the more the more you uh, are tempted into the danger of thinking that you have everything figured out. Because by God's grace, there are like just like uh, you know to, to get back to kind of what Kurt was saying, there are a lot of things that maybe you you, you are right about, and and so you shouldn't be open minded uh, about, for instance, the fact that Jesus is divine. You shouldn't be open minded about. Uh, the fact that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead. There are certain things that we, we, we should say, no, this is, this is an absolute fact, uh, but only because the Bible has told us and we are under the authority of Scripture, not just because I have arrived at that conclusion. It's true because the Bible says so, not because I have concluded that or because I believe it. Um, and so it's, 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 it's crucial that we don't come in. If we're coming into a, a Bible study of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, we don't need to come in thinking, um, I, I have everything figured out, and this is just going to be basically sort of a victory lap, and I'm going to come in, and, and this study is just going to remind me of, of all the things that I already know and not change my mind at all. No, we need to come in thinking, you know what? This <coughs> word of God that he has given us, that is authoritative, that is inherent, that is sufficient, I, I need this to renew my mind and, and, and I need to come in with the attitude of humility under the authority of scripture and say maybe the conclusions I've come to have, aren't fully biblical maybe I need this to change my mind and we need to come in with an open mind and not just come in with an attitude of pulling from the past and everything that we've always understood, but come in with an attitude of humility and fresh open-mindedness and say, God, you speak and I will obey. You speak and I will listen. And if what you say in your word is different than what I understand, uh, then I need to change my understanding to conform more to your word. And I need to renew my mind by 
the authoritative and sufficient scriptures. This was the attitude of the Bereans that Luke praised. They were uh, willing to go back to the scriptures, diligently study them. Uh, they, they weren't just open to, oh, well, maybe this interpretation is different. No, they were, they were going to the Bible to say, what does it say? What's actually there? Not just some, you know, kind of, you know, um, something that someone feels about the text, but they were going to the text and saying, what does this actually say? And if, the, if they were able to look at scripture and see the Bible says this, and if the Bible says that and it disagreed with their understanding, they left their understanding behind and they went with what God says. And that's the attitude that we need to have as we come into um, studying the scriptures, whether in a class or, or on our own. We, don't, we should not come in thinking we've already got this figured out or else we will miss the ways in which we need to be conformed more to the image of Christ. We need to grow more in our understanding. We need to have our mind renewed more about what God has said is true. Um, yeah, again, they examined the scriptures daily to see the, if these things were so. They did not assume that they had perfectly interpreted the scriptures before then. Uh, they were open to the idea uh, that, that that scripture might say something different than their understanding. They were open to asking questions like, did I read that wrong before? Or was there a passage that I missed before? Or did the Bible really say that? Or was that just my misinterpretation? Um, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, because it, it is, it's... Uh, Again, like I said, the better your theology, the more tempted you will be to think, I've got it all figured out. Because we should have firm convictions about certain truths. We should say, this is the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. Uh, you know, Martin Luther, here I stand. Uh, I can do no other. There is one God and one mediator between God and man. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. We need to have those strong convictions, but we have those convictions not, again, not based on our authority as people who believe those things, but based on the Bible's authority, which teaches us those things, which tells us that those things are true. Um, and uh, so we want to have those firm convictions, but our attitude uh, needs to be we have those convictions because we're standing on the truthfulness of Scripture. Uh, and that same attitude not only leads us to have strong convictions uh, about, uh, about doctrine, but also leads us to be humble uh, to say that we, we're always in need of our minds being renewed by, by Scripture. Um, any other thoughts on that? Or, or um, maybe uh, put it this way. How is the open-mindedness of the Bereans, their willingness to be to have their minds changed by Scripture, how does that compare with uh, the way that you normally approach Bible, the Bible either in your reading or in, in, in a class like this? Well, to me, that that Scripture right there is they were eagerness also to see of what Paul was telling them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If they align that with the scriptures and they were all excited about that. Mm -hmm. Well, we should be the same way. Jeff is preaching to us Sunday. We have the word in front of us. Is Jeff preaching what? You know? And a lot of times we have to rely on the Holy Spirit to point something out as well, you know, while you're even speaking and make you look at the word. That's the excitement to me about it is just like they were saying, wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. He's preaching the word, not his opinion. That's right. That's right. And, that, and that's exactly what Paul will write to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1. He, 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 he encourages them. He said, because you received our words as what they were, not the words of man, but the words of God. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And, 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 uh, and, and absolutely, you know, in the, in the preaching moment, you know, whether it's me or whoever who's preaching, um, you evaluate what we're saying not based on 
Am I persuaded by his arguments? You evaluate what we're saying not by how does that align with what I previously believed? You evaluate what we're saying by what does God say and how does that compare to this? And if the preacher is saying something that is in the Bible, then we go with that. And if it's the same as what you believe, then all right, great. I've been believing the truth. If it's different than what you believe, well, I'm going to go with the Bible. Now, Paul says that the, the gospel they're preaching doesn't come through arguments and persuasive speech and rhetoric. It comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes through the authority of, of Scripture. And so, um, and because we are submitted to the authority of Scripture, not the authority of our understanding, we need to have open minds to say, we want to go with Scripture. Our Scripture is on authority, not just on what we've always believed. So discipleship classes teach how to read the Bible, but discipleship classes also teach how to apply the Bible. We don't just want to be hearers of the word, we want to be doers. Jesus didn't say, teach them all that I commanded. He said, teach them to observe all that I commanded. Uh, we are uh, not just to know about Jesus, we are to follow Jesus. Uh, so look ahead, uh, if you're in, still in Acts 17, flip over to Acts 18, verses 24 to 26. Just by way of an example here, uh, someone read for us Acts 18, 24 through 26. So Apollos knew the Bible, uh, he was well educated, he was competent in the scriptures, he was a diligent student, uh, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, he, he, he knew about Jesus, the gospel had come to him, he was fervent in spirit, he was passionate, and he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. So here's a guy who's sharp, he's well educated, he's passionate, and he's knowledgeable, and he's accurate, he's got good theology, but Apollos was still missing something. So again, uh, you can have really, really good theology and still need to grow in your understanding and in your application of Scripture. Apollos was missing something because what the text says is he only knew the baptism of John. Uh, so his, in terms of his practice, his application of Scripture, he had been baptized in the, the baptism of preparation of John the Baptist. He had not been baptized as a follower of Jesus. He was baptized before he was a follower of Jesus, not after he was a follower of Jesus. Um, so he was this gifted, knowledgeable, passionate speaker, uh, boldly proclaiming Jesus. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard Apollos, they realized he was missing something. He, he had an area that he needed to grow in. And so they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. Um, he needed to learn how scripture applied to the particular area of baptism. And so he needed to study the scripture, and there was some information he needed. What does the scripture really teach about this topic? Uh, but it's not just that he needed to learn information. He, he needed to change his practice. He needed to be baptized. Um, and, and he needed to, to, uh, to change in his application of scripture. And even as we look at the New Testament, we can see both of these ideas, doctrine and application. Uh, we need to learn what Jesus has said, and we need to do what Jesus has said. There's specific doctrines and specific situations to apply these things. And that's what we want uh, our discipleships, uh, discipleship classes to do. We don't just want to learn how to read the Bible and what the Bible says. We also want to learn how to apply the Bible, observe what Jesus has commanded. Um, and so we want to observe uh, what Jesus has commanded and, and consider how it applies to certain topics, certain doctrines, certain aspects of life, 
And so in the past, we've looked at um, not only just you know, passages of scripture or books of the Bible, but we've looked at doctrines like uh, the attributes of God, uh, the, the major doctrines of scripture, what is the gospel? Um, but we also want to address different areas of life and ask how does scripture apply to, for instance, you know, biblical stewardship? Um, we look in the fall, the gospel at work. How does, what, what, is, uh, what does it look like to observe what Jesus commanded within the workplace? How does scripture, how do I bring scripture to bear on, on the workplace? Uh, we went through gentle and lowly, uh, considering the ways that Christ relates to us and, um, and the ways that, that that changes our lives. So it's important that we learn to observe what Jesus commanded uh, from, these, uh, from these two different perspectives. We want to start with scripture and hear what Jesus said, and we want to consider how to apply scripture, uh, apply a, with a different topic, a different issue, things like that. So we want to have classes that both teach us what Jesus said, how to read the Bible, and teach us to observe what Jesus said, how to apply the Bible. Um, and so that leads us to our classes for uh, this uh, spring term, term A, as kind of calling it, because this spring semester, we're going to have two terms, uh, and, and they're going to be divided by spring break. So the, uh, the weeks leading up to spring break are, are term A, that's Wednesday, January 11th through March 8th, and Sunday, January 15th through March 12th. So those nine weeks leading up to spring break, we'll have the classes we're talking about tonight. Then after spring break, we'll have a second spring term where we'll have um, additional uh, classes. But for these first weeks leading up to spring break, we have two, uh, two options for adult discipleship classes. Uh, first, uh, like I said, is a Bible study through First and Second Thessalonians. Um, and this, this is going to be primarily looking at how to read the Bible. There's a lot of application in it too, but it's primarily uh, you know, learning what does Jesus say? What is it that has, is commanded so we can observe it? So that's uh, this. The second class is a book study through prayer, how praying together shapes the church by John Onward Chaplin. And so this is primarily about application, about practice, about how, what the Bible has to say about a certain topic and a certain practice so we can apply the Bible. Uh, so the Thessalonian study, um, is going to meet Wednesday nights, 6.15, like we're meeting tonight at 6.15, and also Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Um, it'll be, uh, did I have the location on there? Yeah. The Art All Room. The Art All Room, that's right. Tentatively. We'll see how the sign up goes. Um, but uh, yeah, the Art All Room, uh, or the, the Fellowship Hall Classroom, uh, Doug is going to teach on Wednesdays, and Colton is going to teach on Sundays, and Scott is going to also be in the mix. In fact, he's teaching the first week. Um, and this is going to be men and women's. So we did men's and women's Bible studies separately last semester. We're doing a, doing a, a Bible study together. And uh, so this uh, study is going to be guided by this uh, book from the Knowing the Bible series uh, put out by Crossway. And what it does is it walks you through and asks, uh, it has you look at a passage ask you questions about the passage, and you write, write down uh, your thoughts. So each week, uh, yeah, you'll have, a, you'll have a passage to read, answer some questions about it, then you'll come together, uh, Doug or Colton will teach uh, the passage, and then uh, you'll discuss uh, the passage that was taught and uh, what you learned about it. So um, why study First and Second Thessalonians? Uh, obviously, it's the Bible. Uh, but why specifically? What are the specific benefits uh, that, that, uh, that we get from that? Well, let me just read you a quote. I've got it in your notes. This is from uh, Matt Smethers who put together this study. And he, uh, he writes this. So much has changed in the world since the Thessalonians assembled to hear these letters from their beloved apostle. And yet, in many ways, little has changed. Are we really so different? We, too, need encouragement. And uh, I think if you were here on Sunday and heard uh, Dalen's sermon on 1 Thessalonians, you heard him talk about this, that the, the, the two letters to the Thessalonians are among the most encouraging uh, letters. And so we need encouragement, and you can find it in 1 Thessalonians. We, too, need integrity. Uh, 1 Thessalonians calls us to holiness. We, too, need love. We, 
but you need challenge. Uh, there's a challenge toward holiness uh, to do so more and more. If you we're here on Sunday, uh, which I wasn't. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we do need hope. Uh, there, there's this hope of the return of Christ in First Thessalonians. Uh, we do need virtue. We do need assurance. We do need correction. We do need prayer. We do need prodding. We too need peace. And from beginning to end, we too need grace. So that's just a little bit of a, of a taste of uh, some of what is in uh, First and Second Thessalonians um, and, uh, and, and why it, it's, it's, it's so valuable. I, I've, uh, I've, I'm not going to be in this class because I'm teaching the other one, um, but I've been uh, working on the study on my own just so that I can keep up. And uh, man, it's been a rich study so far. And uh, so if, if this is... Uh, the, the class that you want to be involved in on Wednesdays or Sundays this semester, I, I, I highly recommend it. It's a rich study and uh, really encouraging. Um, and it's a, a great way to excavate the Bible, just like the Bereans uh, in, uh, in Acts 17. So then the other option is this book, uh, Prayer, uh, how prayer, uh, excuse me, how praying together shapes the church. So again, Wednesday, 615, Sundays, 9 o'clock. Uh, also, will be for both men and women, and uh, this class, uh, the plan is that it'll meet here in the chapel, and uh, I will be teaching it, like I said, and uh, this book and the class is about praying together corporately, so it's not primarily focused on our individual prayer life, our private prayer life, it's about our corporate prayer life, about how we pray together as a church, and uh, this book and the class is going to be primarily focused on practicing prayer not just reading about prayer. Uh, so John Onwachekwa says this in the book, and it's in your notes. Our problem isn't the way we talk about prayer. We talk about it with all the fervency and eloquence it deserves. Our problem is the way we treat prayer. Our practice doesn't line up with our proclamations, which is always a sign that something is off. So we are going to read a book about prayer. Uh, we are going to discuss what the Bible teaches about how we ought to pray together, but we are also going to spend a lot of time praying together in this class. The goal is not just to talk or to hear. The goal is to pray. And uh, so we're going to be putting into practice what we're learning um, in this class. I'm very excited about that. Uh, so again, we would highly, uh, highly recommend this, uh, this as well, as we want to more accurately uh, consider what the Bible calls us, or how the Bible calls us to pray together as a church. Okay, so that's a brief little uh, glimpse at, at those, two, um, those two classes. Your next steps, uh, your mission should you choose to accept it. <laughs> is first of all, uh, to sign up for a class, to sign up with your name, your real legal name, and your contact information. I'm not looking at anyone in particular, uh, but to sign up. Uh, and the reason why, why is just because, we, it'll, like I said, we've got, we think we know what the locations are, uh, and we, we kind of have a gauge of, from last semester, but we, it'll just help us as we're planning where we're going and what we're doing if we kind of know who's gonna do what class on which day ahead of time, so we don't just kind of show up uh, on Wednesday and Sunday, and who who is going to be here? Who you know? How, how does all this line up? So, if you would please sign up tonight before you take a book, uh, that would be great, uh, so that we have an idea of who's going to be where in the coming weeks. Um, so, sign up for a class, pick up a schedule and a book. You might have grabbed one of those schedules for these two classes already on that table. Um, if you want to come sign up and get a book, there's also some on this table over here that um, you can get. So sign up, pick up a schedule and a book. Uh, don't wait to pick up a book if you're going to do one of these classes. Get it tonight because, number three, uh, we're going to ask you to read and work ahead between now and the, the first class session. Um, and uh, you'll have an opportunity to read and work ahead every week. Um, but let me, let me just offer this, this challenge to you as we go into the semester. You know, it, right now it's still, you know, early January. I guess it's the first week of January, isn't it? First week of January, we haven't totally failed on our New Year's resolutions yet. We still, you know, are, have a lot of enthusiasm and energy and we're going to accomplish all these things. And so you're probably going to read ahead this first week. But, you know, when it hits, you know, 
the first week of March, <laughs> it's just, you know, the life uh, piles up, business piles up, and it gets harder and harder. So, but I want to challenge you, not just with January enthusiasm, but with even March discipline, do the work. Do the reading ahead of time. Now, if you don't, you can still come. Okay? Don't not come to church because you didn't do the reading. But do the reading. Do the work. Because you will get so much more out of these studies if you work ahead. And come with these ideas already in your mind. Come with these passages. Having already meditated on these passages. Um, you'll get so much more out of it. Uh, like I said, I've been doing this, this first and second Thessalonians study. If, if you just set aside like 10 or 15 minutes a day, you can keep up with this. And not even every day. I skip a lot of days. <laughs> Life happens, you know. Kids wake up with, you know, diapers of ungodly nature. Um, how, how much are the books? How much are the books? Um, you can take one of these books and use it for your discipleship. And we don't... Uh, demand any sort of compensation. However, if out of the overflow of generosity with cheerful giving, not under compulsion, but willingly, you would like to uh, give uh, to, to offset the cost, I think they're about 10 bucks each. Both of you, eight, eight, 10 bucks. If you would like to contribute to offset the cost, you are welcome to do that, but we're not demanding that you uh, pay for it. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Um, so, um, yeah. Again, with just just a few minutes, a few minutes a day, you can keep up with this. Um, it's uh, it, it's not a huge time commitment, but it's very rewarding to have to answer the questions that are in here, not just read through the passage and be done with it, but to really meditate on the passage. So, there's that. Um, this book, you can tell, I mean, it's, it's small, the chapters are short. Um, again, um, if you don't read, it's okay. I will be teaching through the contents so you can show up and you're not going to be lost. Um, we, we are going to, to talk about what's in here. Uh, so uh, even if you don't do the reading, but you'll get so much more out of it if you read ahead. And they're short, short chapters that are, are easy to keep up with. So, I mean, I'm encouraging you. Set your alarm 15 minutes earlier. 15 minutes. Turn off the TV 15 minutes before you normally would in the evening. Make it a part of your daily routine. It, it, you will be glad that you did, and you will get a lot more out of the, the classes um, if, you, uh, if you do the reading and the study ahead of time. Um, and and, and the, again, the, the reason why we do these classes at all is because we want to be and make disciples of Jesus. And even my challenge to, to, to do the work, to do the reading, to do the study, that comes from a desire to make disciples, for us to be disciples of Jesus ourselves. That the, Our mission statement, to be and make disciples, it, it's not just kind of a nice sentiment. Uh, it, it's not a nice thought. It, it's, a, it's a filter. It's, it's a compass. It changes what we do. It, it determines what we say yes to. It determines what we say no to. It affects how we do what we do, doing it one way as opposed to another way. Um, and, and when we think about these classes, you know, our, our mission, again, is to make disciples. Our mission is not uh, to, to spoon feed. There, are, there is a time and a place for just receiving. Uh, but these classes especially give you the opportunity not just to be fed, but to feed yourself. Uh, to not just receive passively, but to actively engage with Scripture uh, and to follow Jesus personally in, in this particular area. Um, and so uh, I would just encourage you uh, to take advantage of the opportunity to dig in for yourself because uh, you will get so much more out of it um, if you are actively meditating, studying, digging into this, um, as opposed to just coming and receiving. Um, although certainly it's not wrong. There's just more. And uh, again, kind of going back to what uh, the, the passage that Dalen was uh, preaching on Sunday. Uh, you've been doing this. 
Uh, you've been studying the Bible. You've been receiving scripture. You've been growing in godliness. I, I'm so grateful for what God is doing in our church. And I just want to say, let, let's do it more and more, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.1. Let's do it more and more. If you've been coming and just um, being fed, take a step to feed yourself more. Uh, if, you, if you've just been coming and, and, and hearing, take, take a step and, and, and dig in and do the, do the study. Um, and then come ready to discuss on Wednesday, January 11th, uh, or Sunday, January 5th, excuse me. Yeah, that's right. Wednesday, January 11th, Sunday, January 15th. That's when the classes officially start. So that's next Wednesday and the following Sunday. So, you know, sometimes when we start a class, we'll do like an introduction week where you just kind of show up. You don't have to do anything ahead of time. And then you get the book and start working. That's today. Uh, but that's today. <laughs> today is the, the introduction where you, you don't have to do anything ahead of time. Um, this uh, term, I guess, leading up to spring break is a little bit abbreviated, and so we're asking uh, you to go ahead and get, get your book now for Thessalonians or prayer, whether it's for Wednesday or Sunday, um, and uh, if you're going to be a part of the Wednesday night class, you've got a week you know, between now and then to uh, either study the first uh, section of 1 Thessalonians or to read that first, uh, first couple chapters of the prayer book. Of course, if you're going to be part of a Sunday morning class, you get a little bit more time. Um, but uh, and we'll have the books available this coming Sunday in here for our combined Sunday school as well. If uh, if anyone isn't able to get a book tonight, um, and definitely grab one of the schedules as well. So grab uh, so sign up, grab a book, grab a schedule um, because. Uh, It'll just be important to follow, uh, especially on the Thessalonians one, how the different uh, chapters are laid out for how we're going to do it. This book was, uh, it's, it's designed to be a 12-week study. Uh, we're going to do it in nine weeks. Um, so for the first week of First and Second Thessalonians, for example, we're asking you to do the work for week one, which is just an overview of First Thessalonians, and it's really short. Um, and then also do uh, the work on the first passage, which is 1 Thessalonians 1 through 10. And uh, there will be a couple other weeks along the way where you'll combine chapters ahead of time uh, to kind of make up for, um, for the extra weeks. But it's all in weeks where one of those is like really short and, and it's not a lot of extra work. So just follow the or grab a schedule so you can make sure to follow when uh, you deal with what since the weeks don't quite line up. And then um, for the week, for the first week of prayer, uh, we'll be asking you to read the introduction, which is just really short, and then also chapter one, which is normal but short, which is normal short in this book. Um, well, so I, I hope that um, I hope that considering our discipleship classes and what we do in the context of the Great Commission, in the context of our mission as a church, is, is helpful as we think about why we do what we're doing, and always you know, want to keep that before us. Um, if, if, uh, if, if this is familiar and if it, if it rings true as, um, uh, as something you, you've heard before, I hope that it, uh, that it, it helps to sink that a little deeper and, and form you a little bit deeper in terms of uh, a, a vision and a, um, a motive for why we do what we do. And uh, I, I pray that this semester, as we go through these, these would be edifying, uh, edifying classes. I, I really... Um, I mean, I think about what what our church would be like um, if we took a book like this to heart and prayer together became an even more core part of who we are as a church and what we do as a church. Um, I mean, uh, it, it's exciting to think about what our church could look like if we become that much more dependent on Christ that much more desperate for what for God to do what only God can do. Um, it, it, it's amazing to think about what uh, what what the Lord could do if, if, if we would uh, just humble ourselves and pray uh, as Scripture calls us to. And, and with with Thessalonians, the one of the main theological driving forces in Thessalonians is the return of Christ. And what our church could look like if we become people who are living today in light of 
that day when Christ returns and, and what we could look like if we were even more uh, driven by the reality that Christ is coming back. Uh, and, that, and, that, and, and that's that's at the heart of what um, the, the message of the, the, the letters to the Thessalonians are. And so um, it excites me to think about what our church could be if we really uh, open our minds uh, under the authority of Scripture and let God renew our minds um, and uh, teach us to observe all that Jesus has commanded. Uh, we don't just want to just go through motions of having classes for classes' sakes. We want to grow more into the image of Christ and grow more um, uh, into the, the head who is Christ as a body. So let me pray for us and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, uh, again, thank you for the time you've given us tonight. And Lord, I just I ask that you would do a work in our hearts and in our church in these coming weeks. Um, Lord, uh, th there is a sense in which um, nine weeks doesn't seem like a lot. Uh, where, uh, you know, a study or a book um, seems like not very much. Uh, and, and Lord, um, if we just go through the motions, uh, then it won't be much. But Father, I ask that you would give us grace not just to go through the motions. That you would give us grace to really press in and to what you want to do in our hearts as individuals, in our families, in our marriages, what you want to do in us as a church, as we study your word together, as we learn to pray more together. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would do a work, that you would make each of us more like Christ, that you would make us more unified as a body, that you would grow us up as a body. Lord, even as we seek in these classes to, to primarily be about teaching and observing. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would grow in, in this in such a way that it overflows into our going uh, and, and, and making disciples and, 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 and calling those who don't follow Jesus um, to, to follow him. Lord, I pray that you would just do a work in us, uh, what, what only you can do by your spirit, by your word, Lord, use this, and, uh, and Lord, use us as we together seek to make disciples and help one another follow Jesus. We love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Come, Simon.